Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And it's an uh, uh, honor to be back to the Minsky Conference. I've spoken here once or twice before and uh, always found it to be very useful. Um, and let me get the preliminaries out of the way. These are my own views and not those of my uh, colleagues in the Federal Reserve System or on the uh, FOMC. The U.S. Congress created the Federal Reserve System 100 years ago largely as a way to provide an elastic currency that could mitigate the banking panics and other disruptions that impaired economic activity and contributed to deflations in the late 1800s and early 1900s. That mission has evolved into what is now known as our dual mandate, the Federal Reserve's directive to help foster conditions that achieve both stable prices and maximum employment. Over the Fed's 100-year history, three major historical episodes continue to provide lessons for today. First, in the 1930s, the U.S. economy experienced a severe credit contraction and deflation during the Great Depression. Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz argued persuasively that inept monetary policy failed to combat these destructive deflationary forces. Second, in the 1970s, U.S. monetary policy tried to do too much to stimulate growth and reduce unemployment when unrecognized structural factors stood in the way. Overly accommodative policy led to soaring rates of inflation. Third, the Treasury Accord of 1951 reminds us that an essential feature of good monetary policy is an independent central bank, one that is autonomous enough to make tough policy decisions. But democratically elected authorities don't just grant autonomy to unelected central bankers, nor should they. The price of autonomy is accountability. In order to maintain autonomy, we need to say what we are trying to accomplish and then honestly evaluate our progress in a way that the public and their representatives can judge clearly. The FOMC has recently made great strides in this direction by explicitly expositing a strategy that reflects the three key lessons of its history. The committee's statement of longer run goals and monetary policy strategy was first made in January 2012 and has been reaffirmed each year since. In it, the committee indicates that price stability is understood to mean 2% inflation in the long run as measured by the annual change in the price index for total personal consumption expenditures, what we refer to as the PCE price index. The 1930s deflation and the 1970s double-digit inflation clearly indicate that the nation is well served by the Fed having a long-run inflation objective and making sure it achieves that objective within a reasonable period of time. The employment mandate is more nuanced because maximum employment is determined by non-monetary factors that affect the structure of the labor market, we can't have a simple time invariant goal. We do, however, project where we think the long run normal or natural rate of unemployment currently is. Today, our estimates for this rate generally range between 5.2% and 5.6%. Such assessments can vary over time. However, the most important determinants of the natural rate change only slowly. So today's assessment is an important input into policy. Being explicit about it contributes greatly to our accountability. Accountability is key. Much as corporations require corporate scorecards and earnings calls to explain quarterly performance, the Fed needs to regularly communicate its policy strategy and evaluate how it's doing. And when we are missing our policy goals, the public needs to know what we are doing about it. We need to decide on the appropriate actions to achieve our objectives and communicate them to the public. To that end, in our longer run strategy statement, we've said that when the economy deviates from price stability or maximum employment, we'll take a balanced policy approach that achieves both goals within a reasonable period of time. To help the public better anticipate the Fed's policy actions, it is important to provide a clear articulation of the FOMC's goals and an explanation of how it views its policy misses and plans to correct them. 
In turn, the public's improved understanding of FOMC policy actions increases their efficacy. This is accomplished by reducing uncertainty over future financial conditions and how those actions might evolve with changes in the economic environment. So what we clearly need is a scorecard that communicates our accountability in a straightforward manner. I like to illustrate our balanced approach to achieving our dual mandate goals with what I refer to as a bullseye scorecard. The bullseye in the center illustrates where we would like to be. In this case, the goals are 2% inflation over the medium term and unemployment at its natural rate, taken here to be 5.25%, which is my long run projection. The scorecard shows an equal weighting of policy misses around our inflation and unemployment objectives. That is, each circular ring is a collection of unemployment and inflation rates that should be equally uncomfortable for FOMC participants. For example, it tells us how the 9% unemployment rate we faced back in De uh, September 2011 can be depicted in inflation loss equivalent union, units by showing the inflation rate that gives an equivalent loss to when unemployment when unemployment is at its sustainable rate. So what is that rate? If, uh, if unemployment was at its natural rate, what would be the inflation rate that would make you equally uncomfortable as if you were facing the 9% rate? The answer is 5.5% inflation. The greater the distance the circle is from the center of the target, the greater are our policy misses. And the greater our policy misses, the greater are the social gains from aggressive monetary and other public policy actions to correct them. The bullseye scorecard approach has three benefits. First, it provides accountability by clearly describing success and failure to achieve our mandated goals. Second, it renders operational the concept of the FOMC's intent to take a balanced approach in achieving our goals. Third, the bullseye guides the public's judgment of the FOMC's likely response to current economic conditions. While we have made considerable progress toward our goals since 2011, we still have some ways to go to reach the bullseye. That's certainly clear in the case of our unemployment mandate. While we've made much progress since the onset of the Great Recession, when unemployment reached a high of 10 percent, 6.7 percent currently is still well above the five and a quarter percent rate I think is the longer run normal. Indeed, 6.7 percent is higher than the 6.3 percent peak unemployment rate in the previous recession. We're still above that. Moreover, we have to ask ourselves if this gap is a good measure of the current degree of slack in the labor market. For example, some of the decline in the unemployment rate over the past four years reflects people dropping out of the labor force instead of finding jobs. Of course, certain demographic factors, such as the increasing number of baby boomers reaching retirement age, mean we should have, expect, should have expected to see a substantial drop in labor force participation for reasons unrelated to cyclical job prospects or the health of the labor market. But when you take a detailed look, it appears that the labor force participation rate has recently declined more than can be accounted for by demographic trends and other such structural factors alone. In addition, the end of extended unemployment insurance benefits and several other factors likely have decreased the natural rate of unemployment, and that, that's what our target is, the natural rate. That's gone down. So the de decline in the unemployment rate likely overstates, to some degree, the reduction of slack in the labor market over the past year. This discussion illustrates how difficult it is to judge where the labor market stands relative to our full employment mandate. A while back, this wasn't such a critical issue. When the unemployment rate stood at 9 or 10 percent, it obviously far exceeded the natural rate of unemployment. Now, as the unemployment rate falls closer to its natural rate, disentangling structural from cyclical changes becomes more important. Thus, at this juncture, it is prudent to consider a wide range of indicators of labor market activity to better gauge the overall health of the labor market. In the press conference following the March FOMC meeting, 
Chair Janet Yellen indicated that in addition to focusing on the official unemployment rate, the committee considers a wide range of data in assessing labor market conditions. These include quit rates, layoffs, and a variety of wage measures, as well as broader measures of unemployment that include discouraged workers and those who would like to work more hours but can't for economic reasons. Generally, the evidence points to a still weak labor market. We still have some ways to go to reach our employment mandate, and that's evident in the bullseye chart. Let's now turn to our price stability mandate. No one can doubt that we are undershooting our 2% target. Total PCE prices rose just 9 tenths of 1% over the past 12 months. That is a substantial and serious miss. And as the bullseye chart shows, this undershooting has persisted for several years. Compounding these difficulties, below target inflation is a worldwide phenomena and it is difficult to be confident that all policymakers around the world have fully taken its challenge on board. Persistent below target inflation is very costly, especially when it is accompanied by debt overhang, substantial resource slack, and weak growth. In the United States, the challenge of below target inflation continues to be underappreciated in public commentary. Mistakenly, many greatly exaggerate the risks of overly high inflation. Before turning to inflation risks, let me mention one reason for some confusion. That is, some commentaries minimize the current below target inflation experience by citing the slightly higher increases of the consumer price index. The CPI is the best known single measure of inflation and its underlying current trend is running a bit above 1.5%. Many commentators compare the CPI against our 2% inflation objective. Unfortunately, this is an apples and oranges comparison. The CPI tends to run about a quarter to a half of a percentage point higher on average than the PCE index. This difference is due to the different market basket composition and its statistical construction. Accordingly, it is much more accurate to describe the Fed's inflation objective in terms of the CPI, if that's what you care to do, to be roughly 2.5%. So against this 2.5% benchmark, CPI inflation also is quite low relative to that target. In any event, the PCE price index is the preferred inflation measure on a number of theoretical grounds and the one chosen by the FOMC as its policy target. Therefore, we should judge the committee's ultimate inflation performance using that index relative to its 2% goal. So, what is the inflation outlook in the current environment? Despite current low rates, I still often hear people say that higher inflation is just around the corner. I confess that I am somewhat exasperated by these repeated warnings, given our current environment of very low inflation. Many times, the strongest concerns are expressed by folks who said the same thing back in 2009 and then in 2010. And, well, you get the picture. Okay, five years later, we still need to carefully assess this very serious question. Let me offer five reasons why I still see the economic environment as pointing to below target inflation for several years. First, many commentators see rising commodity prices as a harbinger of rising inflation pressures. Certainly back in 2008 and 2010, there were instances where energy and commodity prices rose to high levels. This put pressure on inflation and also reduced aggregate demand. There's a lot of evidence that these types of relative price increases result only in transitory increases in consumer price levels. At the moment, even these transitory upward pressures are absent and the current weak state of global demand contributes to downward pressures. Until something unexpected and frankly positive happens with the world economy, commodity prices seem like an even more unlikely propellant for strongly rising inflation than they usually would be. Second, some say a classic warning sign of inflation is the enormous size of the Fed's balance sheet 
and the greater than two and a half trillion dollars of excess reserves sitting on commercial banks' books. Surely, they say, enormous increases in the monetary base are likely to be accompanied by substantial price level increases. The problem with this story is that the banks have not been lending these reserves nearly enough to generate big increases in broad monetary aggregates. And even if they did, as an indicator of inflation, the monetary aggregates lost their predictive content many decades ago. The evidence, again, is that inflation remains low. But what if? What if lending picks up? Well, that'd be really terrific. Dramatically higher bank lending would surely be associated with higher loan demand and a generally stronger economy. Strong growth and diminishing resource slack would be part of this story, and a rising rate environment would just be a natural force diminishing the rising inflation pressures. That would be the obvious policy response if we find ourselves in that situation. In the meantime, monitoring the entire state of the economy, along with inflation, seems like a sensible and appropriate safeguard against this currently low probability scenario. Third, another potential source of inflationary pressures would be rising inflation expectations. Here, I mean a breakout of inflation expectations that's separate from any fundamentals that might accompany the previously discussed cases of rising commodity prices or stronger bank lending. One could think of this as the spontaneous combustion theory of inflation. The story might go something like this. Households and businesses simply wake up one day and expect higher inflation is coming without any further improvement in economic fundamentals. Without appealing to esoteric economic theories of sunspots, these expectations don't seem sustainable in the current environment. Higher inflation expectations would presumably get priced into higher bond market yields and higher financing rates generally. Until inflation actually rises, and remember, this is a story about expectations rising first, ex post, after the fact, real interest rates would be higher, and that would presumably result in a higher debt burden for borrowers. This would reduce aggregate demand. Lower demand, lower growth would further reduce cost pressures, strongly suggesting that higher inflation expectations would not be ratified by the actual inflation experience, and thus would not be sustained. Frankly, this story, although it is mentioned quite often at the moment, seems unlikely. Fourth, another more direct measure of potentially rising costs, and hence inflation, might be stronger wage growth. The economic story here is a bit involved. Most economic research indicates that rising wages are not a leading indicator of rising inflation, so wages are rarely an early warning signal for future inflation. However, higher inflation would lead to higher nominal wage growth, and the double-digit inflation experience in the 1970s suggests that inappropriately accommodated monetary policy can amplify rising cost pressures, creating a wage price spiral. Clearly, unsustainably strong nominal wage increases would very likely be symptomatic of rising inflation pressures. In terms of the current situation, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that currently wage increases are low and not symptomatic of high inflation. The bad news is that currently low wage increases are symptomatic of weak income growth and low aggregate demand. Stronger wage growth would likely result in more customers walking through the doors of business establishments and leading to stronger sales, more hiring, and capacity expansion. During a normal and steady growth business expansion, nominal wages would typically grow at the rate of productivity expansion plus compensation for inflation. If normal productivity growth is 1.5% on average and inflation is at our 2% target, this would suggest that a steady labor compensation increase of 3.5% is sustainable without building inflation pressures. At today's 2 to 2.25% two compensation growth rates, and also labor's currently historically low share of nominal income, national income, there's substantial room for stronger wage growth without inflation pressures building. Fifth, final reason. Do we really know that the public's expectations are for low inflation? Maybe they're higher. Judging by today's Treasury yield curve, inflation expectations remain below our target. 
If anyone was expecting inflation to accelerate in the future, surely individual and institutional investors would demand to be compensated for growing inflation risk. And after all, these are the folks who have the most funds at risk from unexpected rising inflation. Our Chicago Fed affine term structure model implies that the three year ahead average inflation expectations currently priced into the Treasury yield curve are below 2% and remain below 2% for years to come. Given today's unacceptably low inflation environment and the wealth of inflation indicators that point to continued below target inflation, I think we need continued strongly accommodated monetary policy to get inflation back up to 2% within a reasonable time frame. After all, notice that the red and green regions of the bullseye chart show modest inflation above 2% is much more acceptable than even 6% unemployment. The FOMC should be anxious to get to that bullseye region as quickly as feasible given the long, slow path to date. I've spoken so far about how we're missing on our policy objectives. Obviously, the aim of policy is to eliminate those misses. How do we hit the bullseye? What do we do operationally in terms of policy tools? In normal times, the FOMC moves its traditional policy tool, federal funds rate, in order to influence aggregate demand, and with it, economic growth and inflation and disinflationary pressures. Many economists have studied the relationship between actual Fed actions and sensible, explicit policy rules that might capture the Fed's policy reaction function. Historically, Fed policy moves have been reasonably well described by simple policy rules, particularly the 1999 version of the so-called Taylor Rule. This rule relates the federal funds rate to the differences of output or employment and inflation from their target levels. In addition, the constant term is meant in the relationship, is meant to capture the equilibrium real interest rate and the Fed's inflation target. However, this rule does not always describe policy well. For example, given judgmental but reasonable choices for the Fed's inflation goal before it adopted a 2% objective, the Taylor rule misses during the 1990s are big, and um, the chart up above is supposed to show you that discrepancy. Actually, in some cases, these misses were bigger than those associated with the well-known and quite vocal complaints lodged by John Taylor against the Fed for its 2003 to 2006 deviations from his preferred policy rule. Why do these misses occur? Well, the economy and optimal policies that close these deviations from our goals are more complicated than what can be captured by any simple rule. John Taylor clearly recognized this in his very important 1993 article, uh, where the John Taylor rule first came from, in which he stated the following, quote, while the analysis of these issues can be aided by quantitative methods, it is difficult to formulate them into a precise algebraic formula. Moreover, there will be episodes where monetary policy will need to be adjusted to deal with special factors. For example, the Federal Reserve provided additional reserves to the banking system after the stock market break of October 19, 1987, and helped to prevent a contraction of liquidity and to restore confidence. The Fed would need more than a simple policy rule as a guide in such cases, end of quotation. In fact, during the most extraordinary times, such as the 2008 financial crisis and its aftermath, the Taylor Rule completely breaks down. Its prescription would have been to set policy rates at something like minus five percentage points in 2009. Such rates are just not feasible for the simple reason that nominal interest rates cannot go below zero. That is, rates cannot breach what we all refer to as the zero lower bound. Moreover, there is no emergency handbook that comes with the rule that says what to do in this event. An apparently unstated branch of the Taylor 1993 rule includes setting the funds rate to zero during these circumstances and then simply wait and presumably smile confidently in public while holding to zero rates. As a rigid policy prescription, we are thus left with inaction. And inaction looks like policy abdication because we are left doing nothing 
to try to make timely progress in reducing policy misses. This rule cannot be the be-all and end-all for monetary policy. For a policy rule that some say should be enshrined in the Federal Reserve Act explicitly to govern the implementation of U.S. monetary policy, its prescriptions under the recent circumstances we faced are an absolute failure. Furthermore, given that the Taylor Rule has failed so badly and done so for so long, how can we be confident that its prescriptions will still be a good policy to follow once the rule says that the Fed funds rate should rise above zero again? Indeed, that's what many versions of the Taylor Rule say today, that it's time now to begin to increase the Fed funds rate. How can we know if the policy prescriptions are from a reborn and healthy policy tool or perhaps instead from one still suffering from a zombie-like hangover in terms of its prescriptions. It's important to keep in mind that the Taylor Rule's theoretical underpinnings are loose, especially compared with the seminal 1979 John Taylor article on optimal monetary policy in a rational expectations model with sticky prices. Indeed, the Taylor Rule parameters are not necessarily stable. In particular, consider the intercept term. The usual specification of the rule assumes that this intercept term is a constant 2% equilibrium level of the real interest rate. However, it is well known that the equilibrium real rates of interest are not constant, and modern macroeconomic models of optimal monetary policy all take this into account. Assuming that the equilibrium real interest rate is a constant is just an egregious an error as failing to account for the time varying nature of the natural rate of unemployment. We all know that misspecifying the natural rate of unemployment can lead to seriously inappropriate monetary policy outcomes like double digit inflation in the 1970s. One of those three lessons in Fed history that I cited explicitly said we need to take account of time variation and the natural rate of unemployment. That's also a lesson for the real rate of interest. It certainly seems that the fallout from the financial crisis and persistent headwinds holding back economic activity are consistent with the equilibrium real interest rate being lower than usual today. Indeed, if you put any weight, any weight whatsoever on the secular stagnation hypothesis that Larry Summers and Paul Krugman have described, just a little weight, an appropriate analysis would recognize lower expected real rates of interest. In any event, the FOMC's latest policy statement in March recognizes the possibility of lower real rates. As the committee stated, it currently anticipates that even after employment and inflation are near mandate consistent levels, economic conditions may, for some time, warrant keeping short-term policy interest rates below levels the committee views as normal in the longer run. Okay, let me conclude. During Ben Bernanke's eight years as Fed Chair, the FOMC worked hard to make the Fed's policy intentions clear, and I'm confident that the FOMC under Chair Yellen will continue along this same path. When the federal funds rate got stuck at zero and goal-oriented monetary policy Ted said to do more, we did more. We implemented the following, the first quantitative easing program in March 2009, QE2 in fall 2010, the initial date-based forward guidance on the for federal funds rate in August 2011, Operation Twist in fall 2011, the open-ended QE3 in the fall of 2012, which hasn't been completed yet either, and the enhanced threshold forward guidance in December 2012. All of these were ways to go beyond the policy in action that was the prescription of simple constrained policy rules and do something to meet our policy mandates. So, let me ask again. What is the accountability test? Much has been done. However, looking at the bullseye scorecard, I would argue, if anything, the FOMC has been less than aggressive, has been less aggressive than the policy loss function calls for. And to me, in the current circumstances, Accountability and optimal policy mean we should be maintaining a large degree of accommodation for some time. Policies that would instead place us on a slow glide path toward our targets undermine the credibility of our claim that we will do our job and meet mandated policy goals in a timely fashion. 
Timid policies would also increase the risk of progress being stymied along the way by adverse shocks that might hit before policy gaps are closed. The surest and quickest way to reach our objectives is to be aggressive. This means, too, that we must be willing to overshoot our targets in a manageable fashion. Such overshooting risks are optimal if the outcome of our policy actions implies smaller average deviations from our targets over the medium term. We should be willing to undertake such policies and clearly communicate our willingness to do so. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take some questions, and if you would make the determination as to who to call on, that will be the most impartial method. You want to collect questions? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, why don't we take a couple and come All right, let me try. Thank you. Uh, do you believe why don't we do one at a time? <clears throat> the outlook for the potential growth of the U.S. economy has significantly changed? That is, looking out three to five years. And, and if so, does that mean that the outlook, the expectations for real interest rates should be different? Right. So um, I, I do believe that most many, many economic analysts are thinking about sustainable rates of growth for the economy and marking them down a little bit. I'm not in the camp that's marking them down dramatically, but uh, we, we probably have it just under 2.5% in terms of uh, trend sustainable growth. Uh, some are as low as 2, I guess. Um, I, I'm optimistic that the economy is going to come back, that capacity expansion is going to come back, and you, we're not going to be experiencing the secular stagnation hypothesis. I mentioned that in the speech as just a possibility, and if you put any weight on it, it would recognize they could be lower. But in the event that somebody did mark it down, they would imply lower real rates, and that should be taken into account in the policy. The gentleman in back, please. I think uh, one reason uh, there's a perception out there that inflation's going to go up is that it's almost daily these conspiracy newsletters coming out from various investment firms and conspiracy economic consultants. Uh, look at the quantitative easing and the Fed balance sheet, and uh, you know they use some graphs, and so people are terrified. Now, uh, one thing that I haven't seen it—it it must be out there somewhere—is a any um, clear statement from uh, the Federal Reserve or anywhere else on how this quantitative easing will be unwound uh, in such a way uh, that it will uh, kind of be safe for the global system. Is there any publication or any speech? Uh, because it seems like it's almost yep, avoided there. being talked about. Yeah, no, there is. There is. Um, um, you know, back uh, a, a few years ago when the committee thought we were a lot closer to uh, launch Velocity, in June of 2011, we had finally come to an agreement on the uh, exit strategy principles as to how we were going to unwind. What we thought of at that time was our very large balance sheet. That was before QE3 and Operation Twist and, and all of that. And, and we've indicated, you know, things like uh, it's going to be very important once we need to start imposing additional financial restraint, that we have the capacity to do that. We have a very large balance sheet. So putting pressure on the large amount of reserves quickly is going to be difficult. We've tried out our reverse repo program. We can do that daily. We've been testing that, too. That can help to sterilize the effect of that large balance sheet. Also, the term deposit facility. All of this is stated in, our, in the June 2011 minutes. The sequencing that's likely to take place, that we might do that. But we're going to be able to impose more financial restraint when the time comes by increasing the interest on excess reserves. That will be a period you have to you have to be you have to exercise your uh, imagination a little bit to understand this one. That will be a period where inflationary pressures are growing because bank lending is growing. That's the story that I was telling in the speech. And then by increasing the interest rate that we offer banks not to do that lending, they'll have that trade-off. That'll be less inflationary. Uh, we have things like that. Chairman Bernanke has several speeches where he's uh, talked about that. We've also described that we don't believe it's going to be a crucial aspect to actually do outright sales of our assets, that just letting them run off 
will be enough in conjunction with the interest on excess reserves and our expectation of how this will play out. There is a very good a uh, couple of working papers authored, the, the lead author is Seth Carpenter, it's on the Federal Reserve Board site, and it talks about our expected path for the balance sheet winding down. It talks about some risk scenarios, because you want to stress test that, you want to think about, well, what if term premium go up by 100 basis points more than we're expecting here, and it, it describes that, so um, it should provide more information. The woman second row to the back. Karen Lissiker's former board member of the IMF. Um, what about asset inflation? I mean, economists like Rogoff and, and Reinhardt argue that asset inflation is a bigger threat to financial stability and economic well-being than uh, consumer price inflation. And to the extent that asset inflation is a function of monetary policy, I just wonder how the Fed works asset inflation into its calculations these days. Well, the, 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 the economic theory that gives rise to why a central bank should be worried about inflation comes back time and time again to the fact that it's the inflation rate that consumers face and the potential losses that they would take against money in their pockets, basically, things like that. That's, that's why, first and force, foremost, we focus on price stability, which we take to be 2% inflation. Now, in looking at pressures that might give rise to above-target inflation and double-digit inflation like the 70s, it's entirely fair to ask whether or not excessive asset price inflation might spur uh, stronger uh, growth, more exuberance, and more inflationary um, outcomes and, and things like that. Uh, you know, I think the evidence on that, all right, so, so I, 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 think it, I think it sort of comes down to this. We understand that the potential is there in a very low interest rate environment, that uh, investors could crank up leverage, they could get very uh, exuberant and wear, uh, create new asset classes and things like that, and that could um, involve many different counterparties who could be systemically important at some point, and then if it comes down, it comes down badly. So we would certainly not want that to happen. What I keep coming back to over and over again is that's what uh, supervision is all about. That's what appropriate regulatory policies are about in the current environment where we're, you know, putting more scrutiny on systemically important financial institutions and global CIFIs. It's very important that macro credential policies be used. There are many, many other tools to apply to put the pressure down appropriately in those areas so that we don't have to degrade our monetary policy tools, which are fully intended to improve the bullseye situation on inflation and the real state of the economy. That's what that's all about. So we're looking at that. We're monitoring it very carefully. I think it's very challenging even. One, one thing that I notice when I look at these reports, it's easy to sort of look at a market, agency REITs or some other market, and kind of get nervous about it. And then I get nervous about every market I look at because you kind of go, people, could, people have a lot of money at risk. They could lose money. It's not my job to sort of worry about people losing money. We're not going to have a vibrant financial system if I become a nanny that always is sort of tamping people down and I don't see the times where actually productivity growth is very strong and are a good underpinning for earnings estimates. Uh, you know, being much higher. That's what Alan Greenspan saw in the late 90s when productivity actually did increase. So it, it's not for free to just sort of tamp down on asset prices. We have to be very careful. I, I want to use those other tools first and foremost. The gentleman in back, please. Your accountability chart showed a loss function. That means you'll penalize yourself if you have excessive success as much as success, a failure. So in other words, if you do too well, you get penalized by your loss function. So if you suddenly found yourself in the lower left quadrant, it's a 4% unemployment and 1% inflation, would you really cause inflation and put people out of work or would you just move your bullseye? Well, I think that we have to take seriously the lesson from the 70s and other episodes that if the sustainable rate of unemployment, what you described is a very difficult dilemma. On the one hand, 4% unemployment seems like it's not sustainable and would likely give rise to labor market distortions and, and things like that. Now, the lesson from the 70s sort of suggests that that would be accompanied by uh, cost pressures as well, people would bidding up for 
uh, scarce labor and all of that and passing that along and if the monetary authority accommodated that higher inflation. Now, if inflation is 1%, though, that's too low. And low inflation is costly. If I take out a mortgage and it's got a fixed rate of interest and if I'm buying a starter home and it's three times my income, which any real estate agent says you can, you can do, that's not even you know, crazy underwriting. That's just you've got a good future ahead of you. You'll grow into that mortgage. But if inflation's low, nominal wages are going to be lower too. And that mortgage interest rate's nominal, it envisioned hitting inflation targets. And so I'd be losing 1% time and time again, and that would be more burdensome. We need to hit our inflation target. If we found ourselves in the quadrant that you're talking about, we'd, we'd be nervous that unemployment's really low, maybe, but maybe the sustainable rate is actually lower if we're at 1%. percent we just have to see that. But yes, you're absolutely right. Um, our loss function's symmetric. You can overdo a good thing. It's not such a good thing. It will rebound to the negative later on, so we have to be careful about that. The gentleman in the second row. As a graduate of Carnegie Mellon, you must be familiar with Alan Meltzer. And I've met him, yes. Yes, and as a uh, yes. resident of Chicago, would you venture to guess how Alan Meltzer or Milton Friedman would have commented on your talk today? Um, I have um, had conversations with Professor Meltzer in the past, and I've read his opinion pieces in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, he's not a fan of this type of prescription. His is in the other direction. I would say that Milton Friedman, though, would look at the current situation of low inflation and say, you need to get inflation up if 2% is what you're targeting. In fact, that's what he told the Bank of Japan in 2002 when they had been running low inflation at zero, having deflation, and he said they needed to print money. They needed to print money to get inflation going up. I'm highly confident that Milton Friedman, looking at this uh, period, would uh, be much more favorable towards our, our policies and also would be saying we're, we're missing on the inflation objective. I think quoting Milton Friedman will prove that we're nonpartisan, and we'll close on that note. We've been.